And we're back with another Cutest Road to Nirvana, episode 23. I think this is my fourth remake of episode 23. Um, uh, and we're going to be focusing on looking at sh shaded relief models in QGIS for this episode. And um, I'm joined today by a happy band of interns and GIS gurus in, at Cartosa. And uh, we, it's just an informal session. I'm a little bit prepared, but it's not... Um, how can I say? Things might go wrong and we'll figure them out as we go. Um, so I'm going to just show you a little bit about what we're planning to achieve first and then I'll go back to the beginning and show you how I actually made some of these things. So, um, And I'm going to start with the second, showing you the second output first and then I'll show you the first output. So this is what I'm, what I'm showing you on the screen is, is um, a relief map. You can probably recognize the terrain and so on here. Um, but I've used a technique called rock hashes, and um, let me just see if I can find the link for you here. So, um, well, I'll dig into it a little bit more when we get going just now. But it's a it's a very nice cartographic technique which was used especially pre-computer days when you wanted to um, show the uh, show rocky areas, especially as the name implies, rock hashes. And it, you, you put little sort of squiggly bits, if I can go very technical, <laughs> around the, where all the rocks on the rock um, face would be. But the, the patterning was kind of significant to show the directionality and um, the form of the, the rocky outcrops and so on. Um, I've kind of abused it here because this whole area is not actually rocky. So normally you would go and mask it out to just like have these um, the symbology drawn where it is rocky. Um, but you get a very nice sense of the relief in the terrain. You can see the drainage lines very nicely here and um, uh, other little things like these appear to be reservoirs or something on the top of the, uh, of the hill here. And um, yeah, it just can add a nice um, uh, impact to your, to your maps by using this technique. So I want to show you the workflow for this. It's a little bit technical and um, it requires some command lining and some other bits and pieces, but I'll show you more or less how, how we go about doing that. So that's the one uh, thing we're going to show you. And then the other one I'm going to show you uh, is how I did some shading effects for um, this St. Lucia map that we've been working on. Um, uh, see, I'll be where he's in the calls, um, obviously been intimately familiar with this map as well. Um, and you can see like the hill shading effects that are coming through there. If I turn off this layer over here, you can see it more as a flat map. And then with that shading on, you can see it really adds a sense of relief to the um, map without totally um, dominating it. I'll just show you by contrast if I, um, this product versus um, the hill shade, um, uh, which you can see also renders quite slowly. Um, um, the this thing is is kind of fast, but it also um, let me just do like even more like standard one without any. Uh, let me just see. I think if you just did it out the box, you probably get something like this. Wait. Uh, it doesn't reset all the brightness things here. Let me just go back to it. Just reset all that there. Let me take this off. Um, so if you just added a, an, an elevation model to your map and um, said do a hill shade, you get something more like this, which is, it looks very nice, but it's also very domineering, like, you can hardly see the um, the t topographic map features for for all this uh, terrain stuff that's coming through. So the idea is to kind of like uh, turn down the the amount of um, impact that the terrain has, but while still giving hints as to how the terrain looks. So um, it also looks a little cartoony. That um, it's, it looks like you've lost a bit of detail there. This one? The hill, yeah. Yeah. 
and yeah, it's just it's just kind of like um, takes over the map a bit, which is my main objection to it. And it's you know it's a lot of dark um, areas which are very dark, and then like mm -hmm. um, you, you don't really see the contour lines, for example, or the um, you know you don't get a sense of um, what's happening on the topographic map as well. Um, CLB where and I have been you know, having sessions where we talk about how to go about making this topographic map and one of the ideas is, is really contrast is one of your primary kind of weapons in your arsenal of um, developing the cartography and you can see for example the roads are very high contrast here, they stand out above everything else which is in a way the design to show like because the, the roads are a main like um, orientation point and main um, kind of information parcel that you want to you want to be accessing when you look at the map, um, and these other things should be providing like contextual information, but not really dominating everything else on the map. So um, I have made notes on what I'm going to show you, and they're all uh, in our. We have this uh, project for Saint Lucia just, which is um, it's. Oh, it's private at the moment, but I think we can make everything public. There's nothing, um, there's nothing uh, too secret in here. And I've sort of split up the notes by different steps. So I've got a whole series of notes about how I actually processed the original contours into a DEM. Um, in, uh, in, well, I actually first processed the contours to do some data cleaning in Postgres. And I'll maybe come and look at this on a separate session. Um, and then I've got um, some notes about how um, we generated the heel shade from it. And this, this is basically what I'm going to be following through here, um, just showing you the procedure um, to, to eventually land up with something like this, which I've been showing you just now. I have also been experimenting with um, some other techniques that um, are not my own. They come from the work of uh, who's this guy again? I always forget his name. Um, um, but this this blog, something about maps, where he shows um, very nice workflows for doing elevation models, and I want to kind of do this workflow as well. Um, but it involves um, also using some some Blender, which is a three D. Um, visualization and modeling tool. Um, so uh, when I've finished going through all this, I'll sort of try to compare it with what I've been doing just um, out the box in QGIS. But one of the ideas that um, we have with doing this kind of blender-based approach is to actually produce a heel shade with um, with um, emphasis on different parts of the terrain. So um, if you if you live in an area you, and you kind of familiar with the the main features of the landscape. You might know that, like this area, for this this ridge is very prominent, and these terrain features are less prominent. And you might want to emphasize them when you um, build your dim, so that f there's a lot of detail on here, but this is like becomes more uh, almost blurred, not blurred, but less emphasized on the map. So we'll go into all of that later, but um, I'm not quite ready to show you that yet. Um, so we're going to focus on the the dem, and then the part, the procedure for the rock hashiers is um, in a, in another page over here. So let's dive in. If I've got if you've got any questions as we go, please just interrupt me, and um, we can kind of uh, discuss things as we go. So I'm gonna I'm gonna s s just close here without saving anything, and just start off from the point of having a hill shade model and a few. If you don't have, um, sorry, not a heel shed, a, a, a d digital elevation model. If you don't have a DEM, I think I've made previous videos um, showing you how to use the SRTM downloader. Um, and you could use that um, as a basis for uh, getting elevation model from the SRTM um, data set. But that is, I think, a 30 meter or average um, pixel size and the one that we we can be working with today is sort of um, I actually forget what I finally did but I think it's um, like f sub 10 meters so uh, let's actually go and find that data set and add it in here and then we can 
and see exactly what it is. Um, all right, that one there. So, so this is St. Lucia, um, um, and it's been sort of a little bit clipped, but not actually exactly clipped on the coastline. And if we want to see what the, the resolution of the data is, we can go over here and we can look and see. Um, uh, pixel size here, so it's at one, one meter pixels that I'm working with here. So because it's one meter pixel, uh, just to go back in there, you can see that the actual data set is like 22,000 pixels in the X direction and 44,000, almost 45,000 in the Y direction. So it's, you know, it's a fairly decent size bit of uh, data to move around. If you actually look at it on disk, you can see it takes almost a gigabyte on disk. And then I also made overviews, which are another gigabit a gigabyte. Um, so <clears throat> the default way of visualizing um, uh, a DEM in QGIS is to use this um, hill shade renderer here. And if you just turn it on and just take all the defaults, um, it will produce something quite nice looking. You can uh, see the, the terrain quite nicely. You can see some artifacts in here as well. And this is quite common. You'll see it also if you take the SRTM data. Um, just because the, the data is structurally um, organized in, uh, in a way that um, the interpolation tends to um, create values of uh, uh, areas of similar value um, along the slope. And uh, you see artifacts from the actual original contours sort of portrayed in in the in the raster that we produce from it um, but you can see it is quite detailed the the original contours were the, you know like uh, 50 centimeters i think so that you can see lots of little bits of detail in here in a way almost too much detail it sort of um, uh, almost overwhelms you a bit with uh, the amount of things that you're looking at so we can use some techniques to get rid of some of this detail. The first one I normally play with is go to look at these um, resampling tools here. So if you, for example, put cubic convolution on here, and I do it on both sides like this, um, it will kind of smooth things out. I don't know if you can see the difference between what I had before. You don't really see that striation effect so much. Um, uh, you can still see the artifacts of where the contour lines are, but you don't see that um, those like linear, uh, let's go back to like it was. You don't see these, can you see these lines that are these grid lines coming over? So it's kind of useful for, for getting rid of that a bit. Um, there's still other issues that the, the data, like the, the lights and the darks are very, um, strong you almost you almost don't want to have complete black in the shadow and you don't want to have complete white in the highlight areas because it makes it look a little bit uh, plasticky and also um if you are combining it with uh, another data set like that um uh, let's pull in that i'm just going to bring in the web service of that topo map here um uh, like this if we we pull this in and sort of overlay it. Um, I'm just going to use the blending mode of multiplier so that it sort of overlays onto the elevation data set behind it. Um, so it's pulling this from WMS now, so it's a little bit slow to fetch it. So um, you can see that that hill shade, you know, all the detail that we see in this map here gets lost because the hill shade is just blowing everything out of these darks and lights and so on, um, as we were chatting about before. So you could play with simple things like um, having a transparency slider. We can actually, I don't know if you know, there's this little trick here to go, where is the, yeah, you can add this opacity slider into your, into the legend and you can actually just play with opacity right from in the legend which is kind of nice so you could just do some simple things like this reducing the opacity and that already looks a bit better 
Um, it is still quite slow to draw though, and it's also um, it's slow twice, once because I've got this WMS layer coming in over the top, and once because processing this on the fly takes a bit of computational effort. It already looks much better though. You can see it's not dominating the map so much, um, and, and uh, it's kind of like much easier on the eyes. So how can we make this uh, kind of look faster, maybe reduce the, the file size, this 876 megabytes on disk is quite big, um, and also get some like pleasing looking cartography out of everything, out of the, the hill shade. That's what we're gonna try to, to do in this first exercise. So um, the first thing um, that I want to also just say is that the defaults with the hill shade may or may not work for you. You might want to try looking at um, having the sun. You can imagine this line as being like the sun comes in from this direction onto the landscape. Um, um, so you could have it come in from different directions. You'll see the shadows will get cast onto different sides if I do that. So let's, let's send the light in from this side. You can see, uh, sorry, I've actually got it the wrong way around. So the light is coming now from from this way across the, the scene. You can see the shadows get cast on this side. If I put this um, like at 270 more or less, you can see then the, the lights coming in from this side of the landscape. So you might want to think a little bit about um, uh, which direction the light comes in from and also which um, which um, height, like what the azimuth was, like basically how high the um, sun is in the sky. Um, so if we go over here and put it at 90 degrees, it should be kind of like shining down onto the top, uh, you know, sort of directly overhead. Um, and changing the azimuth will change the shadowing a little bit, but um, you can see that a lot of the land is in shadow. Let's put the sun low on the, on the horizon and see what happens there. Okay. So you can see that actually gives you quite a nice, more subtle effect. Um, very strange looking peak over here. When you look at it like this, it might seem like almost too subtle because you can't really see things, but actually we, that's what we're going for. We want something that's um, not, that this is not the primary thing that you're looking at, but it's just adding accents to the landscape. And if you look at it here, you can see that effect, especially when you've got the contours on the map you get a good sense of the terrain without it really um, just dominating everything that you're seeing on the map. So um, there's something else you can do in this uh, in the properties here. You can also say that you want to have multi-directional light. Now, I don't actually exactly know, um, I don't think it adds a second light source but I think it may do some kind of like light scatter modeling or something like that. I'm not exactly sure what the underlying logic is. We can ask Martin Dobiesch from Lutra, who I think wrote this um, function. But I find that using multi-directional gives you a smoother looking um, uh, elevation model generally. So having played around with these different settings and finding something that works quite well, um, uh, one other thing that I, I like to do is also play with exaggerating the Z. So that means basically double the height. If I put two in there, double the height of every landscape feature. And that will cast more shadows or it will, um, uh, you know, if you, if you drop it down to 0.5, make everything half the height of the real thing, it will cast less shadow because it's, you know, things are standing less high in the landscape. Um, so that's something else that you can also play with. Um, so the goal that we have is to produce um, this sort of underlying base map and, um, and then to have it draw really fast. And so it draws not too bad. My computer is quite quickly, um, uh, is quite fast, but um, I think we can get it to draw faster and also to actually store all these settings as a new data set. So that's what we're gonna do next. We're gonna actually go and export this uh, layer as a new product and then see if we can have it uh, stored like the, looking like this in its native styling. So I'm 
going to go to the export option over here and say save as and you'll see that there's this option here for rendered image which probably most people don't use very much but what it will do is we'll, you can see on the tooltip it will write out a three band RGB image using the current layer style okay so I'm just going to go choose a place on my disk where I want to put it um, I'll just make a new folder here node bar uh, 23 something like that I'll drop it in here and we'll just call it shade.tiff it is a sh it's not a dem anymore we're actually saving the like the hill shade model out to to, to a file um, i'm going to make sure that i preserve the, the coordinate reference system and the extents of the um of the layer and and there are options in here which i would normally put like high compression if i'm trying to reduce the file size you'll see that that's a preset and then we'll add some options here to use deflate compression predictor of two and a z level of nine these are all just basically parameters for how much squashing you want to have happen um, um, <clears throat> and if you wanted to you could also build pyramids but actually i'm trying to make it so small and fast that we don't even need pyramids so in, ca in case you're not familiar with pyramids they are like um, sub data sets that get stored in um, inside of the um, uh, data set and um, they're resampled at um, lower resolutions so that when you're zoomed out and you try to draw the, the elevation it just fetches the lower resolution version which is stored um, I can try to find a nice uh, page that shows you how that um, works um, We just get Esri's pages everywhere. <laughs> Let's just see. Here we go. Here's a nice picture. So um, you can see uh, I got uh, I got kiboshed into going into some paywall site there. But maybe if you just look at this one over here, uh, maybe we'll get the full screen version of it. You can see basically the same data set, but it's been reduced in size, and so. Um, it's like the pixels are, are doubled, for example, and then doubled again, and then doubled again. And then, so if you're drawing um, a small scale scene, you just draw this one. And if you're drawing like the, the large scale scene, you draw these pixels here and it will be much, much faster at the expense of some storage space on your disk. Okay, so we're going to um, not use pyramids to start. If it's too slow, then come back and enable the pyramids. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna render that and we're gonna add this the saved map saved file to the map. It might take a minute or two to render it because basically processing all of this uh, the, the heel shade cartography on the fly as it writes out each pixel into the resulting data set. We can go along and look in our um, in that work folder and see you can see it's busy writing the file here and if I refresh occasionally we might see the file size jump while it's rendering does anybody have any questions so far no i'm good so far so good victoria and tabiso are, are these things familiar with uh, to you already am i showing you stuff you already know or? Uh, some of it is new, and some I remember from um, the last week's cut that we had. I can't hear you so well. Can you just repeat? Uh, sorry. Um, some of it is new, and some of it I remember from the last um, cut up for the inclusion that we had. You okay. talked about the first. Cool. Okay, we just got to wait a few more minutes while it processes here. I think we must get you to do another session on how to develop a topographic map, CLB where you can be the, the host. 
So it means that I have to prepare. Uh, <laughs> well, no, you can just do it on the fly. Okay. Okay. Or prepare a little bit. It's not bad, but you know, you don't have to go too crazy. Come on, come on, come on. I think I know why my webcam was not working in OBS is because it's turned on in Google Meet. It's a group progress bar watching session. It's <laughs> a party trick. Are the votes coming on on the um, photo competition there? Um, yes, they are. They are. Here's it's very the, interesting. Who's the early winner or the, lead, the in the lead at the moment? Amy, is it Namibia? Yeah, it's Namibia. Yeah, um, America's photo is starting to look like it's coming out ahead. Oh, really? But lots of people are voting. There's lots of interaction going on, so we'll have to see. I don't think I've seen her picture. Is it on the What Contoza wanna... Facebook page? Or... Yeah, it's on the Contoza Facebook page. I think it's Sausage Play. It's somewhere in Namibiri with sand dunes that are red. Let's see. Let's see. Uh, well, how do I find that? Facebook.com slash something. Contoza. You sh it should just bring up the... Here we go down there. Do I need a, an account to look at it? No, you shouldn't need an account to look. Just look at the page. This is not look. cut, is it? <laughs> no. No, it isn't. <laughs> oh, I could send you the link in this chat. Oh, oh that's Cartoz. Cartoz. Oh. She's still... Uh, <laughs> she... <laughs> Or he, I'm confused because there's yeah, two people in the picture. You sent me the link in the chat. Let's go and have a look. Um, I can't find the chat button anymore. Okay, there it is. <laughs> uh, which chat did you put it in? Because it's not in the this, meet chat. Yeah, I, I just need a moment. <laughs> uh, okay. on the processing are we getting lost in our photography competition all right mm. new chat button there you are <laughs> I sound like such an old man, I don't even know where our own Facebook page is. 
I don't want to initiate a session. I don't think it will let me in. That's weird. That's weird because you should technically be able to see mm -hmm. the page without an account. Ah, winning. Okay. <laughs> There we go. There's no problem in life you cannot solve by searching for the solution on Google. Uh, okay, I can't get rid of that thing. Hey, okay, so here's our, no. our company photo. Wow, competition. Mine is, um, I feel kind of like, um, like I did a very half ass job now. <laughs> Mine, but anyway. Um, where's, the, oh, there we go. There. No? Yeah, there we go. So that one there next to the socks photo of Namibia, that's the one that's currently oh. at the top. Mm -hmm. Oh, that is beautiful. There we go. That's lovely. That is beautiful. Makes you want to run up there and roll down, eh? <laughs> so <laughs> much sand. Spoil the picture a bit with uh, Tim's footprints going up and down the side of the mountain. Oh, come on, Facebook. Yep. I quite like the one of the volcano as well. That one's lovely. One. And whose is that? Um, oh, I forget that right now. <laughs> I think it might be Zaki's actually. That is stunning. Yeah. I think Zaki's one is the one on the riverbank one. Oh, yeah, you're right. You're right. And then that I also like nice. some... That's... Isn't it lovely? That's Gavin's. Beautiful. Mm, I really like that one. That also looks very nice. I like the, the bridge. This seems to be missing a few <laughs> steps along the way. It reminds me of somewhere I went in Brazil. They had this waterf waterfall with a giant foofy slide coming down across the waterfall and then dropping you into a pond below. <laughs> Oh, that sounds fabulous. And what is this? It's like a bat cave. That's Golden Gate. Oh, okay. That's my picture. Oh, okay. nice. <laughs> I just liked how small my fiance seems yeah, in the background, the... you know. And then that weathering, that sort of honeycomb weathering on the sandstone is so cool. This. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Very geological. You really um, followed your own brief world there. <laughs> <laughs> that's also nice. Mm, that's from Faneva. Apparently, it's from Mauritius. Mm. Yeah, and the coastline looks lovely, like the sedimentary rocks, I guess. Eh? Mm, mm. She's about to be run over by a boat, but... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping she's also in a boat. <laughs> yeah. Oh, nice. So anybody can go and vote on, mm -hmm. on it? Mm -hmm. just, on they... Facebook, on Instagram. I think I even put a link on Twitter, but the link will bring you to Facebook where you can like it. Okay, so that first link you shared was the actual one with the voting mm. setup. Cool. <laughs> what are you two up to here? <laughs> <laughs> It's just their little welcome post, I thought. Mm. All right, we're nearly there. We're nearly there. Eighty-six percent. It's going to be worth it at the end, I hope. Let's see if the file's grown on the file system. Oh, it's now at hundred megabytes. It's still um, one tenth, one almost one tenth of the size of the original one, which was almost a, well, I think it was eight hundred and ninety megs. So one ninth of the size. How many of you knew about this opacity slider that um... found out about it today? Yeah, that's also new to me. Very it's, cool. I think it's something that I've been wanting because it's very frustrating to go. It's either properties or the what's this? The layer styling um, yeah, mm, channel. Um, opacity in the layer styling thing because it's on a separate tab in the properties. Uh, so you, you basically mm -hmm. only have the choice of going to properties. Properties. So I, um, from now on, I will have it for every layer that <laughs> I'll be working on. 
because it's it's uh, I, I don't like because i think i'm that person i need to be able to see if things work well so having to go to having to click properties right click properties opacity and they are very frustrating so this i think this will be my best friend from now on <laughs> I think there, like Martin set it up that you could add a whole bunch of widgets in there, but nobody really knows about it that much, and so there's not been new widgets arriving in there. It would be nice to have one for like brightness and other things that you can just slide I, around. Like I that. think I'm, I'm, I'm a widget fan, so if I can get a widget that will make life easier for me, mm -hmm. <laughs> I will definitely have it. 100%, yay. Nirvana has been reached. <laughs> One of the things that, um, just going back to the original page that I, I showed you, that I want to encourage all of you to do, is to do what I've done here, which is make, make a workbook. Like, it's very easy to do if you do it in, um, in GitHub. You just make a markdown page, a .md page. And basically, as you're figuring out the process of doing whatever task you're trying to do, you like log. You, you just keep notes of every step you follow. Take screenshots, write little notes for yourself, because it makes it so much easier to come back and like reference how you did something in the past. Um, and also, it's really nice to be able to share like your workflows with other people. Um, and over time, you should like have like hundreds of these articles to showing you all the different um, kind of key workflows that you use to do your work. And uh, yeah, they can become then the material for, for um, lessons, if you're doing training, or um, if somebody asks you a question, you can say, oh, I remember how I did that. Yeah, just look at this page and it's quickly. Blogs. Yeah. We need blogs. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it can go into the blog as well, but it, it, often you, you might want to use this as like the staging ground while you're working out what you're going to put in the blog, right? And then, um, um, you know, yeah, turn that into a blog article later by all means, yeah. Um, have, you, have we tasked the interns with writing any blog articles yet? We should actually put that on there. Right. No, N not yet, not yet. <laughs> um, they st I think they're still settling in a bit yeah. before being tasked with the blog. No worries. Okay, so Although there, I was thinking. there is the um, result of saving that rendered version. You'll see that this one is a picture. It's not like, uh, it's not that grayscale, heel shade and all that. It's an RGB image. Um, and there's none of these options set. It's all just at the default because I've rendered it out so that those options are like hard coded into the way the pixels are drawn on the screen. I hope that's clear for everybody. So um, compared to this one here where we go in here and you'll see we've got heel shade and all those different um, options all enabled. Yeah. And if you look at just how long this takes to draw, like um, uh, let's, let's just pan a little bit like this. You see. And then we try this one here. You see it can I, I don't know if you can see with the lag on the thing but it draws almost instantly and the other mm -hmm. one takes you know like a half a second longer to draw um, and I think when you zoom out this one draws really quickly and let's see this one is like this one probably. Uh, it's also pretty quick but um, and then you've got the the, the, the thing about the si the file size so this one came out to uh, ultimately it was only about a fifth smaller or six smaller than the original one but it's still um, you know nice to have small files and it draws fast without any um, like pyramids or, or overviews or anything like that all right so let's see how it looks with our um, topo map over the top of it and from here it becomes just a, a case of experimentation and figuring out like which which angle do you want the sun to come from? How high do you want the sun to be to create the nicest looking, um, you know, uh, terrain effects? This slow drawing is now because of the WMS. It's got to go and fetch it. All right. 
And just to compare that on versus off, that you can come on WMS. So that's if I turn it off and on, you can get a nice sense of like if you see here like the valley rid and ridges and Okay, if you uh, don't have any questions, then I'll move on to the other part, which is doing the rock hash shears. No questions, going, going, gone. Gone, okay. Right, so let's talk about rock hashes a bit. Um, so I want to first show you this article um, and also just acknowledge the author of the logic for doing this, which is Roman Geistorvel, I probably screwed up his name, and uh, Lawrence Humi, <laughs> also screwed up his name probably, My apologies guys. Um, the Roman worked on his PhD thesis, he developed this like, routine for, for um, uh, rendering this uh, rock hashier technique. Um, and he's published his, they published a bunch of different papers, but there's one paper here that's probably the one you want to look at. Um, I think it is an open access paper. Try to log in. Um, where's the download bit? Uh, no, okay, this is not an open access one. But there is an open copy of it available. Let me just go and have a quick look. Um, it's PhD thesis is probably the one we want here. So I'm not going to run through this whole PhD thesis line by line, but it's actually quite an easy, easy to read thesis. So if you... Um, got some time go and have a look at it um, um, my definition of easy to read is has lots of pictures <laughs> because <laughs> as I've told you guys I like pictures and um, so um, this is just showing you the um, like the the principles behind the technique um, and um, th these ones are taken off the actual Swiss national map one to 25,000 um, layers, and then he's showing you basically this, um, the principles of how the, like, the light effect is, is done. Um, uh, and then he shows the different um, like applications of, of the rock asher, for example, to show um, outcrops or um, uh, the landforms or the contours and so on. And you get this nice pen stroke effect, which um, it's kind of difficult to do in vector and QGIS. There is some some work being done by Martin to make like a natural pen stroke effect, but um, it's still quite difficult. And these are just other examples of how rock, rock hashes have been used in cartography. You really get a nice sense of the rockiness of the terrain. Over here, it's not rocky, and um, where the slopes are, slopes are steep, you can see the hashes have been drawn like vertically up the side of the hill um, versus where they're more contoured and so on. So um, I'm not going to go through the whole thesis, like I said, but just to show you that all the theory is here and um, just to you know, broaden your knowledge of GIS and cartography, it's well worth having a look at this um, um, approach and he shows you like the different sort of artifacts that you get uh, when you try to develop a map like this. Okay, so that's just the, some of the theory. Um, um, go back to here. All right, so um, to do this, there are two steps in the workflow. The one is to use this plugin called Karika plugin. And the Karika plugin, what it does is it goes and pre-processes your elevation model into um, a form which is like optimized for doing the rock hash uh, development. And then there's a second tool called Piotr, I don't know how to pronounce it properly, which is a standalone little tool 
which you run on the post-processed um, elevation data set. And it will basically produce the, an image like the one I showed you at the start of the session. So um, go back into here. Um, uh, so it looks like, like this. Yeah. And when you look at it from zoomed out, it doesn't look great. In fact, it looks like a hot mess. But if you zoom in to, um, you know, to where there's mountainous areas, then it looks great. So I have not covered one part in this tutorial, which is normally you would make a mask. And the mask would be to like exclude all areas which are not rocky slopes. The moment I've got it just do, producing a rock hash here for everything, uh, which is not ideal. And you, you could make the mask in two ways. The, the Piotr tool actually lets you provide a mask layer, um, which you can provide as a secondary input. And then it will like exclude all the, the masked areas from um, the processing. Or you could also, as a post-processing step, come and uh, produce like a, a vector layer. Um, you know, just even if you just did a quick scratch layer here, just to illustrate. Um, um, and then you could basically draw polygons where you don't want to see the rock ashes. So like maybe I'm just going to roughly uh, sketch something in here. And then, uh, you know, in the most simple way, you could actually just make this kind of like a white fill and um, mask it out like that. Um, yeah, and then you sort of don't see the the hash effect, um, the hash shear effect, um, where you don't want to see it. Um, but you could also use GDAL to go and like combine this layer with this one to produce something new, like um, uh, clip rest by mask layer would do something like that. Um, or you could yeah, there's different approaches you could do. Or you could generate a raster from this one and combine to together like multiply this one by that one anyway i don't cover the actual process of doing that in my my notes um and we can look into masking as a separate um, session if you want to find out how to do that um, um okay so we need to first of all um, get that plugin which is called the Karika plugin so that plugin is just in your plugin manager if you just search for Karika. Um, like this and you see mine's already enabled when you when you install it you don't see anything in the plugin menu it goes into the processing toolbox here so if you go and search for um, it puts it in this group called motlimot.net and you'll see there's this Karika plugin and if you open it it ba basically asks you for a dem and then it asks you for some details here and I just kept the the default um, but if you get into if you go and read the thesis you can find out what these options do and what effect they have on the data set now um, you got to run this on the dem and I'm showing you not the dem but actually the the rakash so I'm going to just go back here and add that dem in here um, Now, I mentioned earlier that this dem is about 44,500 pixels by 22,500 pixels. And um, if I try to run this on this data set, um, QGIS is just going to crash. Let me do that to show you the crash, because I know you're all dying to see QGIS crash. Um, but um, so I, when it crashed, I went on a little side tangent and try, thought, oh, maybe it's like something specific with the Linux version of QGIS or uh, with this, because uh, I'm using the master version of QGIS. And so I, when I first played with this um, technique, it was back in about 2018. So I went back and I wanted to run QGIS from 2018. And I, um, and I tried with the same data set under QGIS 3.0. Two, I think it was, um, and it still crashed. So 
um, I thought, okay, I'm going to try a different approach. And so what I came up with was like an um, approach to slice up the dem into different pieces and then um, rejoin them back again afterwards into one single scene. So I'm going to show you how to slice up a, a, any raster into equal size squares or rectangles. And, uh, and then we're going to just take one of those. Because, um, I don't know, there we go. I was going to say, because uh, just because when somebody else watches you do something that normally goes wrong on a computer, it suddenly will start to work. But it crashed, and uh, I couldn't really see, I didn't want to spend time trying to debug why it was crashing. So I, um, I came up with this approach to, to chop things up, so I'm going to show you how to do that. So just drop that back in again. So there's a nice tool in, um, it's a, a GDAL tool called GDAL Retile, which we can use. So if we search for Retile, you'll see it's in the processing box here. And what it will do is it will take an input data set. In this case, we can just choose the, our DEM. And then you can set a tile size. And I said rectangle because you can actually do different width compared to your height. But um, like I did 2,000 and then it made like um, uh, some, some, let's see how many it made. Um, um, so it made like 278-ish or something like that um, of these tiles. Uh, when when you process them in in um, Piotr, it takes quite a long time. So I'm going to just make smaller tiles for this session and hope that they will process in a reasonable amount of time. Um, and then we'll find one of those tiles and just work with that. Um, so I'm going to chop it up into 500 by 500 meter, uh, pixel, um, which is essentially meters because the pixels are around about a meter um, squares. And I'm going to just take all of these as defaults, but I'm going to choose an output directory here. Um, and I'll put it in that Nerdvana 23 directory that I made. All right. And so then uh, GDAL is going to run this command, basically, to go and chop it up into small pieces. This is where you'd be like copying the, work, the command into your, workbook, uh, into your workbook. So off it runs there. It all runs these kind of things not really nice and quickly. I'm just going to go and actually check in my workbook if I... Um, yeah, so there's the command that I used um, uh, to run it. Type, putting the actual command in, in your workbook is nice because you can just run this from your terminal window and then if you combine uh, you know, 10 steps in a process, you can put them in a little batch file and then just run them one after the next um, uh, in your terminal window and automate things. Um, you could also automate it in the processing uh, modeler, uh, graphical modeler tool in QGIS, although I had some difficulties with this retile thing because it generates all these data sets and I, in the five minutes I looked at it, I didn't have a quick way to like take all those outputs and then ch channel them into the next step of the, of the workflow. So that ran really quickly. It's already done. And if we go look now, we should see like maybe a thousand or so images in this folder because I did them at a quarter of the size of the original, of the previous ones that I did. So this this WC minus L command is just word counts. It counts how many individual um, files there are basically. Okay, so we've got four thousand even more. Okay, so if we add all these um, into our QGIS project like this. Um, uh, um, okay, let's go back to here. I don't know why it puts two copies of that. That's actually confusing for me. I noticed that it did it the other day. It might be a bug in QGIS or something that it makes this one folder and then drops them all in again there. So you can see a lot of these are just one megabyte in size. They're probably out in the ocean or something or 
or maybe they really are just all that size. We're going to have a look. Okay, so I'm going to just drop all of these 4,000 images into QGIS. That might also might make it um, self-explode. Let's see. What I want to do is I just want to find one image which is um, um, kind of nice rocky slope, something that we can use as the, for prototyping the process. Go back to the photo competition while we wait for the 4,000 pictures to load. <laughs> <laughs> Is working. Q just just doesn't give you a progress bar. Okay, I should have maybe just taken a small handful of them. It is a number. Processing it or not. Let me just go. And Last time I got bored of waiting in the night. Just see. Ah, I don't know what to was doing. Uh, okay, it's a, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to um, turn on hill shading on each of these ones so that I can see kind of what the terrain looks like. A quick way to do that is just copy the style and then paste it each one like that um, and so there's nothing too rocky I guess we could use this one as a nice um, example so then I'll just make a note of the number of this tile here so this is 7426 okay so if I want to work with this one I need to um, then turn this into a different um, file format because at the moment it's uh, um, it's in, a, it's in a TIFF, but that tool needs an ASCII grid. But first I need to run that Karika tool on this. So I'm just going to get rid of these other two layers here. And then I'm going to run Karika. So we just go here. Karika. Run this. And um, I'm going to put the output here as... Um, Call it dem dem dot tiff. Okay, and then run that. That's very quick, and it makes a new layer. And the new layer is almost in, uh, identical uh, um, visually to the the old one. Like just zoom in here. If you can see any difference between the old and the new, there's some slight like almost looks like a little bit more blurry and um, I can't remember the theory of what they do when they do the, this Karika process but um, it's, it is explained in that paper okay um, so other than being a little bit blurrier than the other one um, I I, uh, I think it's you know you could also use this one but your, your results won't be as good okay so now we're going to take this and we want to convert this to an ASCII grid file so, um, and there's a catch because the ASCII grid file, if you go here to Google Translate and say, I want to take this layer, the DEM one, and uh, let's put it back out into the same coordinate reference system. Um, and I say, I want to put it into uh, ASCII grid. Yeah, let's go. So we choose the file type here, it's ASCII grid. Oh, are, you, are you guys familiar with ASCII grid file at all? Has anyone heard of it? Um, I think maybe back in varsity, you find that lectures would give you 
I mean, the data to work on, and then you find that they give you an ASC, but they wouldn't explain okay. like the format. Do you know what um, like ASCII like means in the in the word ASCII grid? Mm -mm. So ASCII is just the, like the text system that the computer uses for like um, storing characters, you know, like text characters. So if you go and mm -hmm. search for ASCII like this, you'll get a like a, a table showing you basically there's a hexadecimal code for each key on the keyboard. In the old days, it was you know just um, there wasn't uh, the UTF. Um, keyboard so you had basically just the western alphabet um, represented um, nowadays you get this utf8 encoded which has got um, in the ascii encoding there was only 256 i think um, characters available um, and then the utf you've got like 65,000, so you can have like mm -hmm. full chinese or whatever your alphabet so that basically what it's saying is that you're just making a file which contains text in it so if i open that um, uh, where did I put it? Did I run it? Uh, one, one, once I run it, you'll see that it just stores text in that file. So that's the command that it's running. Okay, and again, that you would put in your workbook. Uh, and it's going to make this file called dem.esc. Okay, so if we run it, um, I'm going to look over here. You'll see that it really is just a plain text file um, so um, it's got this six header lines which is the number of columns the number of rows and then the geolocation of the top uh, uh, the lower left corner the LL stands for lower left um, on the X and the Y axis and then how big the pixels are in the X direction and how big the pixels are in the Y direction interesting you'll see that the pixel size is actually different in the two directions and um, so it means that pixels are not exactly square. And then what follows is um, if the row is 500 um, columns, then you'll get 500 numbers separated by spaces, which each one represents the pixel value in that column. So this format is actually quite nice because if you wanted to hand make a raster from like some analysis result or something like that, you could actually just open a text editor and start typing and create your own raster just by typing text in the text editor. Um, but one of the little gotchas is that when Q just makes this ASCII file, it uses this DXDY format. Mm -hmm. But the Piotta tool wants it in uh, in a different format where this is called cell size and it just has a single value. So um, to deal with that, um, um, translate cell size. There is a flag that you can pass to the GDAL translate um, um, ASCII. Oops, um, I think I put the link in my notes here. Let me just say. Um, So in here, you'll see that I had to pass this force cell size equals yes flag. And they explain this in, um, in GDAL's documentation. We go like this. Um, right, that's not the GDAL documentation, sorry. Um, I'm just showing you the, the cookie uh, crumbs so that you can see how I actually figure out solving some of these problems. So you can see by default, you get a DX and a DY parameter, which is what I showed you over here, DX and DY. But um, uh, uh, if you put it to cell size, then you'll get square pixels, right? Because it only gives a single value. Um, 
and so that value will apply for both uh, x and the y. Um, so some programs that say say um, uh, need to be setting that cell for cell size equals yes, and then it will actually force the the output to have square pixels. So to pass that parameter in QGIS, um, we can try to do it in QGIS here by going to here and say minus CO, and that CO gets added into the um, into the command that we type, and CO is just a GDAL um, uh, flag. They call it a flag on the command that you pass to GDAL, which says. Um, Get what the C stands for, but the O is of, um, uh, creation options, so it's short for creation options. So I'm saying when I create this ASCII grid, I want to give you this flag for cell size equals yes, and then I'll hopefully we'll get a square pixel um, matrix out. So let's run it again and have a look. I'm just going to close this and open it again. Now you can see that that line has changed to show just a single value. That was just a bit of hoop jumping because Piotr, the tool that we're going to process to generate the rock hashes, requires that um, uh, to be in this format, not in the other format with the X and the Y. Okay, so now we've got this dem ASCII file. We're also going to create um, a PNG version of the, um, of the data set. And the reason for that is that Piotr, which is the tool that draws the rock hashes, just makes an image when it's finished. It will make a PNG image of the same size image as the one that you gave it to start with. But that image is not georeferenced, so it won't load up in QGIS and show in the right place. So, so to deal with that, um, we can make like a placeholder PNG file of the same dimensions, and then um, uh, swap it out with the one that Piotr creates. So if we go here and just call this PNG, and I switch the form file format that's gonna create to PNG. PNG, PNG, PNG. Like this. And then uh, just hit run. I've taken those creation options away now. Um, okay, and so that will have created a new file. Um, this PNG file. But what it also creates is this PNG aux.xml. Um, and that is that aux.xml is like an, an um, auxiliary file, that's what aux stands for, um, written in the XML markup ex, uh, extensible markup language. Um, and it will contain the description of the georeferencing for the for the layer. So you can see this stuff mm -hmm. over here, the geotransform and uh, coordinate reference system. It's all contained in this file because you cannot embed it inside of the PNG file. With a TIFF file, usually this gets embedded into the TIFF file itself. So what we can do after we've run the analysis and we've produced that the Piotr's PNG output is we can swap the, this file with the picture that they produce and then it will be georeferenced by using this file over here which we won't change. Hopefully that made sense. Okay, so going back to our little uh, workflow here. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff explaining how to get Piotr installed. And Piotr has got its own download page over here. And uh, you'll see there's the Linux version and uh, Windows version. And he's got some notes here about this glibc, which is the GNU C library, um, which needs to be on your computer. And to cut out some of the, the hassles that I had, like I can explain that this probably won't run on a modern Linux distribution very well because um, uh, the Python, I think it also used, does some Python processing and um, it just basically will crash out as you try to run your analysis. So what I did was I run it inside of a Docker container and um, Docker is just a way to like uh, containerize an application on Linux, Windows or Mac. So if you're on Linux, we're gonna run this under Docker. If you're on Windows, you can try the, the, the download and it should just work directly for you. Um, so when we're gonna run it, what we wanna do is we wanna take this dem.ascii file, let's just, um, 
this style files again here. I want to take this file here, pass it to Piotr as an input, and then have it generate um, a, p a dem.png file. Um, it will actually call it something else, which is the picture of the rock hashes. So um, let's go back to my notes here. So this first part is just about getting it downloaded and, st and installed, which I've done already. And then um, I'm showing you here the, the command line options that it expects to take, which are um, uh, it takes um, this minus h file, a mask file. Remember, I was talking about using a mask file before, an output directory. Um, uh, and then these two flags, which I can't remember what they do, but I went and got the, uh, let's just see. Yeah, I printed out the help documentation here. So they don't actually explain the, the H flag in the documentation, but um, you can see that it's minus L flag tells it how much, uh, what the integration length is. And again, you need to go and look at the thesis to understand what that does. The minus D tells it where to put the images in the session file minus M is for the mask, and then the last thing you pass is the actual, that ASCII grid file. Um, all right, so um, we want to run that, we want to do all those things inside the Docker container. So I've compiled here a simple one-liner Docker that will actually do that. It will sort of take the Piotr um, folder and um, mount it into a Docker um, container and then mount your current working directory into the temp folder and um, and then it will run, uh, it will set the working directory to the Piotr directory. It will run this Alpine glibc. Remember it said something about needing a glibc version 2.7 or later. So, um, um, which is Alpine is just a very minimal version of Linux that's going to run inside the container. And then it's going to run this Piotr command. Don't be confused by the fact that it's called .exe. It is still a Linux um, command line tool um, with these options. Okay, so I'm going to actually just run this step here to just get everything because I'm in a different folder to where I was before. So if I just run that, that will download it. Um, that will unzip it. You can see it's unzipped all these files into this Piotr Linux directory. And if I um, run, run it without any options, it will tell me what the inputs needed for the command are. Okay, and then um, let's try to run it. So it's expecting that your dem is called dem.asc. So let's try to, I've already done that, so we can just try to run this directly. Um, Okay, and then it starts to run. And so these are all the outputs that the command produces. And again, it's all kind of technical details that you need to go and look at the thesis to understand what they are for. Um, but basically, it's like computing the, um, the lighting and the um, slope characteristics, and then going to generate that PNG. Now this is what we might need another continuity break because it after this 100% you think it's done, but it's, it still takes a little bit of time to complete that final step. Have you got any questions about what we've been doing so far? Is, is the process clear for you? I am going to be challenging you to go off and make an example of this at the end, so hopefully you've been kind of paying a little bit of attention. Okay, that ran quite quickly compared to the 2000 by 2001. No questions, Victoria and Tabisa? None at the moment. waiting for the relief polishing to finish. There we go. So at the end, you can see that it's saved this um, image out. It's still doing some more um, work. It actually made a shaded relief as well, which we can have a look at and see how that looked. 
Um, so remember, we were doing shaded reliefs in the first part of the session. It's done its own take on what a shaded relief will look like. And then it's taking that and then doing the contour strokes, the fill hashias and the rock hashias. Okay. And it's produced this file over here. Okay, which is the one that we're going to then copy over to replace our dem.png. Let's first have a look at this file over here just to see how it came out. So um, if you want to see that, it's now going to be in this um, directory here. Where are we? Uh, so it puts it in this output directory. You can see this two the two images that it made. That one's the relief. Oh, that's very pretty actually. But, uh, probably just as an abstract <laughs> painting, pretty. Um, and then um, this is the rock hasher that it made. Okay. Now, if we were masking, we might mask away some of these areas. And you can see there's some artifacts around the edges, so that also gives us an indication that maybe if we're going to do this and tile them together, we want to have some kind of overlap and then maybe cut them out and like in, to remove this color around the edge. Okay, so that, if I put this into QGIS, um, it's not going to show up in the right place because it's not your reference. So if I put this in here, you could, it should be coming on top of this one, but it's not. So to fix that, um, what we're going to do is we're going to copy that file over the top of our dem.png. So we're going to say copy. Um, that file there over the top of dem.png. Ah. All right. And then if I go back to my file manager here and go and look for this dem.png. Uh, remember now it's got this auxiliary file which is giving this uh, georeferencing. So if I drop this into QGIS, QGIS will read that. Oops, I copied the wrong one. But you can see that it put it in the right place. So let's just go try that again. I copied the wrong one, so I need to do this one here. All right, so now it's georeference, it's showing up in the right place. If I go and bring the, um, uh, the topographic map that we've been working on into this scene. Um, uh, sorry, is that the right one here? And then I use the multiply um, option here to just combine it with the layer below it. Maybe turn off all these other ones just so that they don't create confusion. All right. It needs the masking to be done so that you don't have it in flat areas or whatever. But where it's rocky slopes, like for example here, it does a very nice job of portraying the, um, the landform for you. And that's it. That's what I have to show you. I am going to be running this across the whole island and masking it. And uh, to uh, we need to find out, see, be where we need to find out where all the rocky areas are. That's a separate issue. And then um, we'll create a mask and then just um, run this across all the rocky areas so that we can have this as a nice layer inside of the topographic map so that if we, um, for example, let me show you. Um, uh, let's go do this off screen quickly. Um, I'll show you what the, the old topographic maps look like. Um, Second to pull that up. Let's take this one here. Um, yeah, 
So that's their maps from, what was the date on these again, Silvio, can you remember? Mm. 1981. Okay. So if we zoom in to find somewhere where there's rocky coast, let's see if they've got, yeah, for example, you see here they've used a similar technique to show they're not actually rock ashes, but it's in a way similar to what the rock ash has done. So they found the rocky areas and they've uh, generated these patterns along the edges. I'm going to do a, another session maybe with you to show you how we might do this with vector data because Niall recently added some, I think in the previous release of QGIS, some cartography tools for, that I think we can make something similar to this with. Um, but yeah, so we can basically find all the rocky areas. Um, maybe we can just digitize along these coastlines, even CLB with, mm -hmm. and then uh, run that technique there and have these as, you know, um, uh, part of the texture that goes into the, um, into the topographic map. There's some more examples there. I think these were all done by hand, obviously. So we to the procedure we generate them. So, so beware as a, you know, as a follow-up task for the interns, maybe what would be nice is to give them these maps and let them just go and clip out, um, you know, like to first make the mask layer to say where all the rocky coastline areas are. Um, and that mask layer would be just basically polygons around each of these areas. Mm -hmm. And then we can turn that into... Um, into the mask layer and use that when, uh, along with the Piotr tool to actually make those rock ashes along the coastline. You can see in the middle area as well, they've got similar kind of photography. And that's where my story ends for today. Um, unless you've got some questions or anything you want to discuss about it. I think... From my side, it's just to revise everything, especially the, the rock hersha part. It's very interesting. Cool. And also read that thesis. Mm. Hope it's not too long. I it's don't good like bedtime reading. reading. Just skip to the pictures if you, you know, okay. you don't have to read every single word, but just get the, you know, read the, if it, generally if you're reading like a scientific paper, read the abstract at the front and the conclusion at the end. And then dive into the methodology if you want to know the details of how they've done things. But um, you don't need to, like, if you just want to have a broad understanding of what they've done, the abstract and the conclusion should give you, like, that broad understanding. And then, um, you know, dig into the other bits of the paper that are relevant to what you need to, to know. All right, everybody. Um, I'm going to stop recording. If you want to... Uh, want us to do other episodes on some topic that's interesting for you, you're always welcome to send us a message at info.cartosa.com um, or come and hang out in the QGIS um, chat room on Telegram uh, or pop us a message on social media and uh, yeah, maybe we'll do something that's interesting for you as well. Thanks interns and Silbiwe and Amy. We'll chat to you next time. All right. Cheers. Cheers.